Welcome, everyone out there to a very special show for the Vegan Organic Network. I'm super pumped to have Dr. Will Tuttle and Madeline Tuttle with me. How are you both doing? Great. Thank you. Thanks. Good to see you, Giles. It's lovely to welcome you to the Vegan Organic Network. We've got a special show today. And start off, I'd just like to start off by saying how tanned you both are. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we're in California and it's a very sunny. And it's apricot season. Oh. <laughs> so we look like apricots. <laughs> you, look, you both look extremely healthy and California is one of my favorite places. I've been there quite a lot over the years. We had a wonderful time uh, driving up to Yosemite yeah. on the coast road and ah, fond memories for me of California. So it's good to see you looking so well. What have you guys been up to? What have you been up to recently? Make it a little louder. Great. Okay. Um, so what we've been up to uh, for the last uh, few years is uh, tr- spreading the vegan message, traveling. You know, we lived for 18 years in an RV, uh, what you call a caravan, I guess, a, a pickup truck pulling um, a, uh, a rolling home. And so we went to all, we've been to all 50 states, just traveling and giving lectures. Then about uh, 10 years ago, we finally saved up some money and bought a little house here in Northern California with one half acre of land. And so we've been continuing to travel and give lectures promoting veganism. Uh, My book, The World Peace Diet is a bestseller and translated into many languages and Madeline is an artist and has a lot of art of animals celebrating their lives. So we give lectures and we've been doing that and we're still doing that. Uh, We just did a lecture tour to Florida and Arizona and Texas and the Southern part of the United States a couple of months ago. Uh, We're back here now. So we're here maybe half the year and on the road about half the year traveling. And while we're here in the summer, we're gardening. We have, we're so glad we have a garden. So it's basically traveling, speaking, making music, spreading the vegan message, and now for the last 10 years, gradually building up a vegan food forest, which has been a a great project. And Madeline is um, a very experienced gardener from her years in Switzerland. And so we we always thought living in the RV all those years, all we could do was grow sprouts on the gu- on the counter. Yeah. <laughs> so now we have uh, we've planted like a bunch of fruit trees. We've got about seventy fruit trees now, and uh, a bunch of other stuff. Beautiful, and I've really enjoyed your music, Madeline. You play the silver flute beautifully. Thank you, thank <laughs> you. Yes, I I play it every day. I I love doing it. Beside gardening, I love playing the flute. Yeah, it was a wonderful thing. I watched one of your videos, and it, you said like after our morning meditation, we are now expressing ourselves through the music, just letting that letting that come. And I had someone here recently who's making a film about chanting in uh, in Britain, Great Britain. And she came in, I said, well, before we eat, come into the garden and see our garden. And we have our own little food forest going on in our garden. And we picked herbs for tea and we picked vegetables and salads and, you know, spinach, 20 different types of spinach, right? You know, the greens wow. and chard. And, <clears throat> and we put it in and we said, but we, we sing to our food. We pray to our food. We bless our food. Yeah. You know, we're not just eating it. Yeah. getting that spiritual abundance from the food and we made the food and our cameraman he, he'd never eaten food like it in his life wow yeah. nice never yeah had food with such life force and blessings and you saw him come alive you know? <laughs> personality change the abundance rise so i suppose that is the big question okay how do we garden for abundance Wow. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Yeah. I, I think you just mentioned it. We love. We um, I go through the garden in the morning and I specifically don't uh, pull anything or harvest anything. I just take a walk and look at the different uh, plants and and uh, mm-hmm. I feel uh, some whispering and I I know what I have to do then the rest of the day to have them content in our food forest. Right. And, you know, the thing I think is, uh, 
what veganism is, is really the core of our life, which is, I think, the old um, Sanskrit word ahimsa, which means violence. And I, I think an even better word is love or loving kindness. Like Madeline says, having a sense of love and a sense of um, the sacred and a sense of respect for all aspects of nature. And so really it's healing the wound in our society. You know, I think our society with animal agriculture, we have this basic sense of being superior to animals and superior to nature and afraid really of animals and afraid of nature. They might come back at us the way we attack <laughs> them. We're always attacking animals and imprisoning them and drugging them and so forth. And so now we're afraid of nature. And so now we do, I always say this, we do uh, plant agriculture in our society the same way we do animal agriculture, right? We, you know, animal agriculture is dominate, exploit, use our power over. And uh, plant agriculture was a total different thing. It was always done by women traditionally in, in the sense of um, being something that is bringing out the best in us. We're nurturing, we're planting seeds. We plant one seed, we get a thousand seeds, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's working with the natural abundance of nature, the natural givingness of, of the infinite love that supports all life here on this earth. And so when we left the garden and we said, no, we're not going to eat that way. We're going to dominate and exploit animals. And that was basically just bringing out the worst in us where they're always trying to get away. Uh, we're impregnating them against their will. We're stealing their babies, killing their babies. You know, it's violence. And so now we do plant agriculture the same way. We use pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. We monocrop. We kill anything besides the one crop we want to have there. It's the same, the same mindset. And so why go to the store and buy food, even if it's plant-based food, if it's grown with that mentality and that practice of domination and exploitation of land and nature and using uh, these toxic chemical fertilizers and this whole mentality of exploitation, we're eating exploitation. We're eating residues of toxic chemicals. So it's just fantastic to actually explore. It's like this adventure of learning how we can reconnect with the basic benevolence of life on earth that we're given to. When we give, it comes back. Whatever we put out comes back. So like when Madeline goes out and she's giving and she's listening, like she said, you know, I'm listening. She wants to give water, give whatever we can <clears throat> to into the earth and into the, the web of life there and build the soil and build the, the, the wisdom, the knowledge that's in the micro uh, microbiome of the soil you know, just mm. build all that up and just keep increasing it and I think it's increased not just by matter but it's increased by our consciousness and that's one of the things we we feel like we feel a sense of being uh, connected to the beings out there and the plants are beings uh, the insects are beings there's all these beings this whole web of, of beings and so one of the things I think the real thing to explore more is how when we do that year after year, then gradually the plants and us become one more and more. I mean, we, they, their food isn't just food. It's actually what we would call, say, medicine, right? I mean, uh, it's healing food. It's not just food. And it, and it becomes more and more kind of weird to actually go to a store and buy somebody else's food. <laughs> I mean, why? it's like having sex with somebody else's wife or something. It's like, you know, it's like, like what is this? It's crazy, you know? You, you, do, you do your own, you, you, you put your love into the land and the land loves you back, right? You don't go and buy someone else. I mean, that they're doing it, it's, it's kind of like this prostitution thing. So I think really, it's, it's really about, about developing a relationship with the beings and seeing them as I think I think plants have intelligence you know they have a tremendous intelligence and we don't recognize it just like we don't recognize the intelligence in animals either we just look at them as objects that we're going to dominate and use we sell them by the pound like we're selling these vegetables by the pound I mean you it's ridiculous this is life and so the whole idea is to see the beings as beings. And I think when we address that in them, it brings out the best in them and it brings out the best in us. And if we don't do that, we're taught in our society to never do that. We're taught in our society to see nature as dead. And uh, I think the spiritual traditions of the world encourage people traditionally, and at least the traditional sacred wisdom was to go out into nature and be quiet 
just sit in nature, sit under a tree like the Buddha, right? He sat under a tree and listened and he, and he was aware of the cosmos and was, became aware of his own mind. And when we quiet our own mind and listen, it's a meditation and we can create a sense of affinity that what we are is not separate from the universe and from the source of the life that's flowing through all the plants. It's the same life. And when we garden with that awareness, I think that's that's when the real healing begins to happen. And we can all do it on some level. That's what one of the things Madeline always emphasizes, right? How to everyone, she, even if you can, you don't even have any land. You just yeah. have a little a pot, a pot, a planter, <laughs> and, or, or yeah. some sprouts in the kitchen or something. Yeah. I mean, I <clears throat> when I lived in Japan for a while. I saw how, you know, everything is tight there and they grew cucumbers on the balcony and the whole railing of the balcony was full of cucumbers and the lady in her kimono came out and harvested the cucumbers. I was very well aware what she was doing. I was learning. Right. So that's a, that's a great question, Giles. The, the abundance, I think, that is uh, it's already there. We just have to connect with it. I think really it's a spiritual practice, quite honestly, of quieting our mind, forgetting everything we've ever been told about food and about life and about nature and learning from the plants and learning from uh, what veganism is, of nonviolence. And the people, <clears throat> how they And learning from other people. Yeah, yeah right. Who've gone before us. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, talk, talking, of, uh, talking of great, inspirations i know that you spent time with alfred vogel the great dr vogel madeline yes do you have any do you have any uh, stories or what did you most learn from him yeah um it's so interesting um like he gave lots of talks and uh, I, I was um, being uh, there too and and uh, guarding the table and uh, resold books uh, selling books and things and so when i went to the gardens he had around uh, basel in switzerland and other places it was his second nature uh, he was like in his 70s and then older and he climbed the tree and got the cherries and he said you know at the same time you have to prune don't, don't just get also um, give some freedom to the tree and he can breathe better the air everything it's it's really good for the tree to prune at the same time so i remember this ringing in my ears <laughs> and many more things of course i could go on and on but uh, he had two uh, little patches of potatoes and he said i can demonstrate if i do uh, an organic patch here which he did and then a non-organic just for testing and all the potato bugs were on the non-organic because the plants were weak and didn't have all the uh, mm -hmm. elements and and the, um, the nutrients so they they were attacked and it, it was so interesting so it, yeah. it was like totally enlightening to me yeah it, it, it really is isn't it well let's talk about the food forest a little bit um i have planted um with friends of mine a forest garden here in the uk and it's a six acre plot and we've done it over the last 11 years and it is now i mean it's a miracle really people see it we built a peace circle in the middle of the land we celebrate there we have ceremonies um there's many aspects that we've that we've incorporated into the into the site uh, but the abundance there is just phenomenal. And I think one of the reasons is because we are mimicking the most effective land use in the temperate world, which is a forest. You know, surrounding me I've, where I live, we've got these forests. Well, the farmer doesn't have to put any pesticides or herbicides or insecticides. The forest just yeah. grows. It will keep going. It will keep going what a miracle that is and to be able to mimic that as i know you guys have i watched some of your lovely videos 
um, of your of your food forest. And that's what we're doing here. We, we've not devoted a lot of land to growing. We've built raised beds. But the abundance within those beds is just miraculous. I mean, for us here, um, for probably three months now, we've been picking so much salad and greens. <laughs> So, you know, in that morning smoothie, I mean, even my tea, you know, I probably got 10 different herbs in my tea. Didn't cost me anything. For me, that's abundance. And it's also part of that knowledge of knowing, you know, what you can harvest and how you can grow things and and bringing these things together. So my wife doesn't like to plant in rows of vegetables. She just likes to have a mixed bed. So our beds are, and, the, you know, the companion planting and mimicking yeah. what nature does for its abundance so can you tell us a little bit about your food forest yeah we have um i have actually a few uh pictures i could show i'm going to try just doing this quickly because wow. it you know might might help to uh to see that so um basically <clears throat> the um i'll go ahead and just put this on uh here entire screen so um this is, let's see, I'm going to uh, go back here. Um, when we first moved here, let's just uh, get these. I think I'm lost in my, where I am. <laughs> um, okay, this is how it was when we first moved here. This okay. picture, that's our, that's our trailer we lived in, in for uh, 17 years. Wow. And so we cleared a little space there beside the driveway. But to the right of that, that's our food forest. Uh, now, <laughs> but it was just some um, rocks, a little bit of grass, which was only green for a few months of the year during the rainy season, because we're in a Mediterranean climate here yep. where it doesn't rain from April till November, yep. right? So most of the time it's yellow grass, and, but in the winter, this was in November, so we'd had some rain when we first moved in. So it, it was just, uh, and that was a little, the little corner. We have a little herb garden. Yep. And... Um, uh, so we started um, just planting things. This is a little tiny uh, apple tree that we planted. Uh, this is how it looked, basically. There was just uh, nothing there. And then gradually, but with planting, uh, things started to come. And we uh, were able to, over the years, slowly get more and more uh, diff different plants. We started making terraces and uh, planting trees we like i said we've planted 70 fruit trees and some nut trees this is a little tiny um fig tree that's now just gigantic <laughs> oh lovely <laughs> you know, and gives us you know two two harvests every year of, oh. of hundreds of figs yeah it's oh. really amazing and so gradually everything you know starts growing when you plant the seeds and then tend the 10 things and this is like i said this is the kind of the beginning we just had a um a very thin nylon fence to keep the deer out originally and uh, gradually we, we we just upgraded everything <clears throat> and uh got more and more uh things uh, coming this is the um yeah it grew in the meantime yeah this is that same corner this is the kitchen guard like the herb garden outside the kitchen this is you know some of the uh, things that we started getting and then it get me even more developed oh, wow. with time and yeah. uh, even more developed with time. So it's uh, it's really been uh, just a great adventure of, of seeing, you know, how it happens. This is kind of in the beginning, it would look more like this. Yeah. And, and then at one point, um, yeah, this is the very, this is how it was in the, wow. when it was in um, before, when it was uh, in the, in, in the summer before it get turned green and uh then we we had we did these these uh terraces which really helped a lot so instead of having a, a, a diagonal piece of land we have these three main terraces and then we planted everything kind of uh on those and um and then madeline made a sign uh our karuna food wow. forest sign which is now that's the main gate going in oh. Very cool. Yeah, and uh, and then we we love growing uh, winter squashes, winter squash. kabocha squashes, Pumpkins. and they they uh, this is us. We have an old Volkswagen bus that we would bring plants home in <laughs> from uh, trees and plant them. 
<clears throat> and these and are some of the figs and peaches right. and uh, this is uh, almonds. We have an almond tree that really gives us a lot of almonds and apricots. And this is how they, the squashes grow up high into the manzanita trees. Wow. And it's really neat. They, I climb up into the trees to get them. These are some of the apples and uh, Chinese apples, Asian pears, I guess they're called. Uh, we have yeah, mul Persian mulberries, Ooh. Uh, goji berries, which you, it's goji. called wolf, wolf berries also. Yeah. And um, lots of uh, nectarines and plums and um, peaches, peaches, lots yeah. of peaches and walnuts, lots of walnuts. And these are the these are the squashes growing high up into the trees. <laughs> they, it's really in the fall. It's like uh, festooning the trees, and then we get lots of persimmons and also walnuts. in the fall. Yeah, yeah, persimmons and walnuts come in the fall. <clears throat> and these are these um, called miner's lettuce. This is actually just a nature gives us this. Yeah, it just comes up <clears throat> all volunteer. by itself, volunteers, but they're delicious. In Endless the, salad. Right. Can make. Right. In the yeah. early spring, when we come back from our tour, there's lots of miner's lettuce. Madeline puts it in the smoothies, and we, we have big green smoothies. And this is how it is now. It's just a huge forest. Yeah. Uh, it looks like this. It's just uh, full of uh, fruits and uh, and this is our, we have a compost bin. And so we're always building the soil with our compost and put the compost in there mm -hmm. and we add mulch into that. And then we've built now actually six raised beds because we have ground squirrels that like to sometimes eat certain things. So these are protected. So yeah. Madeline plants lots of greens in there and vegetables. And, they, and I figured out a special way to put a cover on the front so they don't, um, uh, so nothing gets in, and uh, so we have six of those. These are you can see some of these different raised beds that we have, and we get lots of grapes. Also, we get lots oh. of grapes, and uh, uh, we've planted, and uh, so it's, <laughs> it's really a lot of fun. And then we have citrus. Oh, yeah, these are the oranges. Yeah, right. Oh, we have yeah. mandarin oranges, lemons, grapefruits, and um, and kumquats. Great, and and then oh, Madeline makes borage tea. Compost, like a plants. tea compost tea. Yeah, this is an yeah. ongoing thing. This is one of her major workouts, like going to the gym, right? You yeah, yeah, yeah. Carry <laughs> two, uh, two, two gallon uh, jugs of um, that tea. Yeah, um, she carries it around the garden with and... water, and then I, I just go the whole afternoon. I go and deliver. Right. So it's uh, this is like typical morning. She brings in all this. Greens and this that goes into, the, smoothie, into our green it? smoothie. That's the green be smoothie. A big smoothie. Yeah, yeah. And then and then some of it'll be for dinner too. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, it's like really we have we love our green smoothies in the morning. It all comes right from right from the garden, like you were saying. This is something we just put in recently to to grow the the, the uh, tomatoes and squashes and cucumbers can grow up these ropes. And and these are some of the trees you can see. We have a special little section over here. Which is like a little swamp. Yeah, miniature marsh. A little marsh. For, for right. the lizards. We have alligator lizards. Right. Which uh, are about nearly 50 centimeters long. And they're really beautiful. And so they love to hang out there. Right. They're, they, we love to have these little animals, lizards and snakes. And, um, and Madeline has a thing over here with the straw on it for growing ginger. And uh, and so and then we have a we have a little pond we put in also and of course some um, a swing to yeah. sit in and enjoy the whole place and and this hose you see this kind of brown hose I'll tell you about that later but that's a special hose that only um, delivers water that is recycled from our house which is an important part of the whole thing uh, I have to explain that later. And this is a nectarine tree that gives us tons of nectarines. We have a whole line of fruit trees along the back fence. And now it's a, it's a metal fence for the deer. We have a lot of deer here, so <laughs> we have that. And this is some of the, um, more of the flowers and the grapes. And this is how it looks now in our, yeah, in look our how herb. On the right, the butchie it got. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right. So so that's pretty much it. That's Those are the photos that we have of our wow. food forest. Well, yeah. That's a, an amazing transformation. And I think it goes to show, doesn't it, what you can do yeah. in sometimes in, in harsh environments. I mean, where, where we've planted our food forest in, uh, in Essex in, uh, in the UK, it's yeah. the driest part of the whole country. So 
there are thousands of fruit trees on the land on this six acre plot mm -hmm. and there's no water there's no mains water so it all wow. had to be done through digging ponds and then mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there was a ditch around the land and then pumping out of the ditch into the ponds and now pumping into water containers and then feeding the water that way feeding the plants that way you know to keep it alive and obviously then when you get to a certain stage happy days you know you might need yeah. to climb that tree and give it a prune like uh vogel was saying right and, and give it your love and, and all of that but it will just then take off i've never seen squashes growing so high though <laughs> i know <laughs> they go way up there we do that in our climate but and I, I, I was, I was actually, thinking. you know, um, I saw it uh, the first time in Basel yeah. and um, they uh, they had a tree. I went walking and suddenly I saw all these window squashes hanging yeah. down. And then I thought, wow, this is amazing. We have to do the same thing. And it grows the same way. They love to climb up. Yeah. They just go higher and higher. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to try that. I'm going to try that one. It's, uh, yeah, try it. It might the work. They talk about the stacking, don't they? You know, but um, how high can it grow? I remember visiting Auroville in India. Oh, yeah. And there was a food forest there that they had done completely um, veganically with no animal inputs and it had taken them 40 years wow. in a landscape that was completely had been completely decimated by the English and the French mm. and having the uh, the monsoon and the extreme heat um, you know even warmer than where you guys are but they had done it and they had done it by what will actually grow okay we'll grow this and then we can use that for some mulch and then we can grow something else and something else and what I witnessed was a little bit like what you've just shown me or a little yeah. bit like if you if anyone came to see the maypole forest garden and it's it does take a little bit of patience and a little bit of planning but my god what you can achieve i mean right. what you've shown me there it was getting me hungry <laughs> those figs oh oh those figs i know they're just god. coming out now yeah but I, I um i would like to share a little bit about the um the the water recycling i mean because yeah. here i was gonna say california yeah. a lot of yeah. problems with water yeah yeah we, yeah we wa water is kind of an issue and um and we're especially now california is in pretty uh unprecedented droughts so um so we have to be careful with the water and so we've we've installed first it was one uh, drip irrigation system and then two and then three and then four and then, now we have five basic yeah. controllers and so we, we they're on timers and that's really works great so we don't have to actually water um, every day we have we have this on a timer it goes every day for half an hour and just drips into the roots of all these different trees and plants and herbs and bushes and berries and vegetables and everywhere everywhere is on yeah. our drip irrigation system so we have that happening and that and that's pretty um, conservative of water and mm. but it's really necessary because it gets hot here I mean it gets into the 90s and the 100s and really sunny yeah. so the plants really need the water but the neat thing is that the food forest itself with the shade of the trees creates a microclimate where it's much cooler and nicer than the surrounding area yeah. and it, it attracts of course birds and insects and so forth which is good but then um uh we've added to that our, our gray water and gray water basically is the water that comes from the sinks and the kitchens and the and the showers and things in the house the washing machine. yeah so yeah. so basically I, I just went underneath the house we did this together actually under the house and where all the pipes come down uh i installed a valve on e on, under the kitchen sink the bath both bathroom sinks both bathroom showers and the washing machine so there's like seven valves on these pipes and then diverted every single one of those pipes we put in a 100 gallon tank under there we were able to just able to fit it in <laughs> and so they all go into the top of this tank and and gradually it takes about five to six days yeah. mm -hmm. to fill up the tank and then uh, we put in a pump on the outside of the tank that pumps the water through the wall of the house out to and there's a controller for the pump out there 
And so in the garden, and so Madeline can just can turn on the little switch for the pump and that starts pumping this water out of the, uh, all, our, all of our gray water it comes out of the tank and she waters all of our plants with that water. And that's, that's great of itself. But then there's another <laughs> part that I, is very important, which is that we also eat, have in our bathrooms a container that we pee into. We call it amber. We, we read a book called Liquid Gold, which is the, the, that our, the human urine basically is a fantastic source of nitrogen, nitrogen. and phosphorus in the garden. Yeah, yeah, many and so, so we've been doing so, and it's, it works perfectly. We, we pee into a little container, pour that down the sink, along with the with and then fill the container up a couple of times with water and it dilutes the the amber uh to uh perfect i mean it just dilutes it nicely yeah. and so then we spray that out onto the onto the garden it's the it's our gray water mixed with our pea water our, our amber and so the the plants are getting a super rich uh addition of of <laughs> water and uh, nitrogen and all the, and phosphorus, but also our information, right? I mean, it's very important. It's like, this is us, this is our, our beings, it, you know, really, there's a tremendous amount of wisdom teachings, especially from India, China, and Asia, about the healing effects of human uh, urine. I don't like to call it urine. Shivambu. Shivambu. <laughs> Shivambu, yeah. right. Yeah. And Shivambu is a healing uh, power. And so, um, so we, we actually, that goes into all of our plants. It goes into all the fruits, the nuts, the seeds, the berries and, uh, herbs and vegetables and everything and builds the soil and builds the information web and all the microorganisms and everything. So I think all these things are things that we've kind of forgotten in our society. We've tried to, oh, we, we don't, we don't want to talk about that. So we think that's dirty and we think, uh, we have to, we have to put chlorine and everything. <laughs> kill all the bacteria. I mean, the whole idea is to build the bacteria up. They're our friends. They're not the enemy, they're our friends. And they, they uh, help to create more life. And it really works fantastic. I mean, we, can, we, we have a whole ambience. It's like a, really like a farm. It smells like a farm, you know? <laughs> this <laughs> yeah. certainly, a, right after, otherwise for it's about like an hour. A yeah, but citrus it, flowers. Yeah, no, it really, it's, it, it's just a wonderful experience. And um, and, and all these different ways of building up the soil using compost, compost teas. We yeah. also, every year we apply a whole layer, a pretty you know, yeah. thick layer of wood chips, um, which uh, has built up the soil a lot as well. Yeah. And, and then of course we have effective microorganisms, EMs that Madeline puts around and some other things like um, the, the sea vegetable yeah, things. Sea we, 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 we buy some things, some supplements and also minerals. We have a friend, Don Weaver, who's a longtime vegan, and I think it might be good to interview him sometime. He's really an expert. He just moved here to our area, uh, but he, he's been a vegan for uh, over 40 years and is very knowledgeable about remineralizing the soil and has written a book about it, actually. And so he really taught us about the importance of remineralizing the soil with glacial rock dust. Yes. And so we've spread a lot of glacial rock dust here, which really remineralizes the soil also. And so I think all these things are important to just be aware of, but the most important thing is like Madeline said, is to just listen to the plants, be loving and be in tune to them, what they need and give mm -hmm. them the nourishment and the love. And like, you, like you're saying, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's a fantastic uh, transformation and it's really a foundation for vegan living, I think. Yeah. It's something everyone can do. We can all do something yeah. Yeah. to start producing our own food and it's getting more and more important nowadays because we know the food, sh the food webs and the food uh, system and the, on the planet, the entire planet is very uh, fragile. And with petroleum shortages and all these other things, it's important to be able to grow your own food mm -hmm. and to be able to grow food that's healthy and to be able to store that food and to learn these things that we've forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is part of vegan living. Vegan living is about sustainability. It's about minimalism. It's about creating uh, a conscious awareness of our connection with the planet and minimizing the violence that we're causing, right? So maximizing the amount of love and awareness we can radiate out into the web of relations 
And we can start right where we are by creating, we call it our space, a space of love, yeah. space of healing. And that's our space, right? There's no meat, dairy, eggs, wool, silk, leather, alcohol, drugs, you know, no violence. And and just and just have it be a meditation space. It's a it's a it's a it's an aspect of of the um, of the meditation path. I have we even have a sign here. Besides the Karuna Food Forest, we have uh, Krumjak Jungsa, which is Golden Footprint Home Temple. I mean, this is when I was um, in Korea. I was living in as a Zen Buddhist monk in a Buddhist monastery in a Zen monastery meditating and we grew our own food there and and we actually for thousands of years in korea they did the same thing they would they would actually mix the um the everything from the outhouse <laughs> uh all the human manure with yeah. straw and put it out on the fields right i mean this was this they did this for thousands of years they knew this is this was good to recycle and then they would meditate and they would they would we would go out into the fields as part of our meditation and harvest potatoes and so forth and then we would eat that it was and and the pre pre preparing of the food like madeline always when she goes into the kitchen uh it's a meditation to yes. prepare food we don't prepare food and, and watch tv at the same time no. you know it's it's like putting the love into the food like in india they know that the, it's not just the f matter in food that gives us our health it's the what they call the prana yeah. uh, or the chi it's the energy in the food and so if you're putting good prana into the food while you're preparing it and, and preparing it with mindfulness and love then people get that they hear that that's why we don't want to buy food from a factory what what kind of energy is in food that comes yeah. out of from a factory where it's just machines and it's terrible you know so we so our food is unprocessed i mean we we buy our own Holy food yeah we yeah. buy we buy grains and we have our own mm -hmm. stone mill we grind it madeline bakes bread with grain that she mills herself the oats she grinds up by hand every morning that we have you know to, to, to flake the oats and putting our own energy into these things uh is really i think important like like what she's wearing this is um something she knitted herself it's from flax and linen <laughs> And I'm wearing a shirt exactly. she made. This shirt she made this out of linen, right? I mean, the whole idea is we can make our own things. You know, she spent years learning handcrafts, knitting, and spinning, and creating uh, uh, clothes from. She even had your own flax, right? Yeah, she, oh, yeah, yeah in Switzerland, flax. she grew her own Little flax. Bit only. <laughs> yeah. And then I yeah. broke it with with the wood and and uh, yeah. had yeah. the fibers, and then one can spin it. Right. So, I mean, we need to remember these things and not just yeah. think we have to go to a factory and buy everything. We can learn to make things ourselves and then we value it. It has our own energy in it. And it's, we don't, and if it rips, we don't just throw it away. We, we fix it yeah. <laughs> so we can, so we can use it again. You know, this, these things are all, I think sort of lost arts, part of but it's part of veganism. Life, yeah. Vegan living yeah. is yeah. about that. You know what? what I learned as a Zen Buddhist monk, you just keep mending your robes. You don't throw them away. You yeah. keep mending them because everything is precious. You don't waste water. You don't waste cloth. You don't waste land. You don't mm. waste anything. Don't waste time. Every moment is precious and the earth is precious and all the animals. So the whole idea is to just do the best we can for the short time we're on this earth mm. to learn to respect and to question the official narratives in our society that are embedded in us that take us away from that, that, that tell us, no, just it's cheaper to do it this way. Let's just buy it and throw it away. We have to question all that stuff. Yeah, and that's that's a great idea. That's that's the underlies the food forest idea. I think it's a, it's a it's beautiful to hear you talk. I was in London on the weekend at a big <clears throat> vegan festival. Um, you know, one of the biggest ones that we have here. And apart from our presentation when we did this healthy Indian food thing, and I had you know, 20 vegetables I'd brought from the garden and all of this. No one was talking about what you've just been talking about. Mm. This is one of the biggest, the, I didn't, I didn't see one stall promoting what you're talking about. Uh, I didn't hear mm. one person talking about that aspect of veganism. And one of the things that has happened in, in the UK in the last five years, we've seen an enormous growth in veganism. A massive amount of i mean i i don't know the 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 
the comparison in the states but i mean it's just gone like this hmm. but what's happened is that the movement has very much been taken over by well where's the money you know yeah. there's right. a lot of money in fruit and vegetables right uh, in processed i'm not going to swear here yeah. but processed you know <laughs> you know and junk and food the thing is is what we're trying to put across myself and my wife who's a nutritional expert is as you're saying it's a whole food it's organic or if you can get it veganic you know i mean everything right. we're going here is veganic but uh you'd starve in the uk if you said you just wanted to have veganic i mean we don't grow enough food and we've got three children we can't feed our children with our plot here and try and pay the bills on our rent and everything but it's just doing what you can yeah and it's returning people to the earth again right Whereas i think and that's the thing i'm really getting from what you're talking about listening that sensitivity whereas the most people that i come across their consciousness is that, um, well, let's save the, you know, we're doing it for the animals, vegan for the animals, because they've seen the horrors of uh, animal exploitation. Yeah. And they don't want to have anything to do with that. That seems to be the number one reason. Big movement recently towards environmental uh, concerns. And I think a lot of people, it's been explained to them that animal agriculture is very polluting and uh, harmful for the planet. And then the third one is possibly people's health that some people have understood. And I personally don't believe that um, it's necessarily the diet for everyone because we're all unique. But if it's right for you to eat, eat uh, fully plant based or a high level of plants, then there can be many health benefits from it. But one of the things that and it ties into your fantastic, uh, fantastic book, if you haven't read it here, well, <laughs> please diet, but get yourself a copy. One of the things that i really feel is important is feeding the world right and something that i think <clears throat> is not spoken about enough within the vegan movement is that right. we have approximately a billion <clears throat> starving people in the world right with this with so-called advanced civilizations with our technology and vaccines and whatever else that uh, <laughs> we think that we're so clever that we've created and you know mobile phones and the metaverse and 5g and whatever it might be but there is a billion starving people in the world and the simple thing is i mean the the amount of food you are producing on half an acre the amount of food i am producing in my garden the amount of food my friend is doing in, in his food forest the metrics are enormous compared with you have the field you which is most of the land around here 75 percent of land in the uk i believe it's just feeds animals right it's mm -hmm. so wasteful right so yeah. ridiculous and then there's starving people whereas yeah. we can have such abundance and i think you guys are really leading the way you're pioneers in it you're living you're living it and it's just wonderful having been in this sea of stalls of, of this vegan event of just i mean lots of wonderful things as well i'm not knocking the whole thing but i'm not seeing anyone who was talking with the passion that you were, apart from possibly me with me a little bit doing me old <laughs> you know. And, no, you're and right. How do you find it in the US? Is it? Yeah, no, it's the same problem. Yeah, it's the same problem. And uh, in many ways, so. the um, the vegan movement, I think, has been infiltrated, like you say. It's, you know, somewhat by well-meaning people who, who want to make money selling uh, processed plant-based foods, I think somewhat uh, infiltrated because they're the globalist, the globalist agenda uh, is actually um, hijacking all of the work we've been doing, right? We've been doing all this work for decades, trying to create a better world. And they're hijacking this, this the, 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 um, <clears throat> the sort of the foundations that we've been laying and the cult and the uh, cap sort of the cultural capital that we've been <laughs> building and, and using it uh for their own devices and getting people to eat factory farm junk food which keeps them sick and keeps them needing pharmaceutical drugs and medications and that's one of the things i think that needs to happen is people need to realize that about a hundred years ago we had this uh the oil the rockefeller mining the oil um they took over they created the, the petrochemical industry 
uh, as a way to grow more food. And they created what they call the green revolution, which was basically not green. It was basically a revolution of creating more disease and more hunger, but a lot more uh, chemicals and shifting the foundation of agriculture from soil to oil, basically. And then out of the petrochemical industry came the pharmaceutical industry, you know, which is basically toxic chemicals that instead of putting it on the land, you put it right into people's bodies and right into the bodies of animals, cows and pigs and chickens. There's over 10,000 different toxic pharmaceutical drugs and antibiotics that are used on cows and pigs and chickens. And then people eat that stuff and they get sick. They need, they need drugs. Uh, and then, so this whole drugging of the land, drugging of animals, drugging of humans with toxic chemicals, petrochemicals, it's all petroleum. And so it's wasteful of petroleum. We could feed everyone. This is well understood. I write about it in the World Peace Diet. We could feed everyone on a fraction of the land. If we would switch to an organic, whole, plant-based way of eating, we could allow the rivers to heal, the oceans to heal, the forests and prairies to heal. We could have wildlife. We're in the middle of the ma largest mass extinction of species in 65 million years because that we're cutting down the rainforest now at like four acres per second to grow soybeans to feed to imprison cows and pigs and factory farm fishes. And all of that's unnecessary. It's all completely unnecessary. This war against nature. It's in, when we, like you say, we pride ourselves on being intelligent and having all this technology and we can't even feed people. We could easily feed everyone. Yeah. So uh, we have to, each one of us, I would say, refuse to comply with mandates that take away our freedom, take away our ability to grow our own food, to actually grow our own food. Don't buy foods from factories, really. I mean, if you're a vegan, I, I would say don't buy, I, I would never buy, I mean, maybe people are transitioning, but once you once you get there, don't buy foods from factories and we can grow our own food or support local farmers growing fruits and vegetables. It's much healthier, organic. Madeline was Miss Organic. When I came over, when she came over from Switzerland, it was like nothing but organic and, and she's right. I mean, th it's very important to, to build the soil and to support the farmers that are doing that, not only for us, but for the hungry people and for the animals and wildlife and future generations and insects and all, the whole web of life here. And uh, all of this is interconnected, but we have to realize there's no money in healthy, happy people, right? I mean, they're not gonna make any money on us. I haven't, we haven't been to doctors in 50 years. I haven't, we haven't been to a drugstore to get one, anything, aspirin or whatever in, in, since the 1970s. Yeah. So I, I think it's important for us to take responsibility for our health, for our food, for our information, for our energy, all those things, that's where freedom is. There's no freedom without responsibility. And veganism is about freedom. It's about giving animals their freedom and having human freedom. And these industries wanna take that away. And the vegan movement uh, can be used to take that away. If, it's not, if, we're not, if we allow this movement to be infiltrated, like you're saying, we're not helping. Uh, we're not helping hungry people. We're not helping agriculture. We're still paying for toxic chemicals and the destruction of our environment. So, um, you want to add something? Yeah. Oh, I like that in that uh, psychological, um, like people are not in harmony many times and they have to go and get some medication by the doctors mm -hmm. and all that. And going into a garden is, it's yeah. kind of something I can feel it each time. It's something I, I just receive so much. And even if I have something on my mind, maybe a little heavy or a problem or something, it, it just gets lightened up and uh, maybe some solutions or something. And yeah. instead of going into the cities, which are full of EMFs and, and chemical and, <laughs> and air and this, um, I mean, exhaustion and everything and uh, all that, just go into the garden and, and do the food instead of going to the city and buying it in, in a store where there isn't any fresh air in there. and. And like Will said, the, the factory food, it's absolutely not veganism if we eat all these uh, 10 times packed foods and that trash and everything. One can make oat milk from oat grains and one doesn't need packagings and all that. So one yeah. can be more vegan. Yeah, I think also if you're, um, 
even if you're in a, uh, a more urban environment, uh, it's still always possible to grow something, to yeah, kind of create yeah. your little niche uh, until you can maybe get onto the land. I think getting onto the land somehow is really, really uh, uh, important. And the other thing besides being therapeutic, like Madeline says, it's like, you know, going into the garden is like going into a therapeutic <laughs> kind of a, a place, but it's also, we, we laugh about it almost every day. It's like going to the gym, you know, it's like, I go out, I mean, I'm out there. It's like, it's always physical. It's physical. Yeah. It's really physical exercise, yeah. lifting, yeah. moving rocks, planning yeah. things, carrying things around, heavy, you know, it's really great exercise. And you're yeah. you know, right there in the garden getting exercise and doing something that's that's healthy. You're gonna get giving and it comes back. Yeah, everything you stay at the gym, the spa, everything. I mean, yeah. one can uh, be very harmonious. We even have our shower out there. We haven't taken a shower actually in our house in like eight, nine years. A solar shower. We have, we yeah. have our shower out in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh to be oh to be back in California. One of the things that I take great heart from is that the, we have the answers, we have the solutions. Right. They are there for us. And I think that it is, as you've said, it is that reconnection with nature. Uh my friends, we're gonna wrap this up, but I tell you what, I think this should just be part one, quite frankly, because I would love to spend some more time talking to you. I've made a list of questions. I think I've only got through a third of them. I just want to finish with uh just a couple of things, really. So I've got my boy, he's four. My youngest boy, he's four. And his favourite thing. Strawberries. Strawberries. If we can see that. But you know what? He doesn't want to eat the ones from the shops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. No. They don't taste. He's a, he will not eat them. He will only want to eat our own strawberries. And he's out there every day foraging, you know, and he's enjoying them. Strawberries. <laughs> wonderful. And it just goes to show where is the true power, you know, yeah. it is in nature. We can really get it. And then the other thing I just want to fin finish on, I'm just going to send this to you through the screen. Uh, wow. Dr. Will and Madeline Tootle, thank you so much for being part of this amazing show. I've learned so much myself. I'd like to learn more from you as well. So maybe we can uh, do a part two sometime and uh, chat about a few more of these things. Uh, how can people get in touch with you and keep connected to you? Yeah, we, we're pretty easy to get in touch with on the internet. That's probably the best way. Uh, either worldpeacediet.com or willtuttle.com. That'll take you to the same place. And Madeline has, we have a YouTube channel and Madeline has uh, some gardening videos and intuitive cooking videos. I've got lectures, we've got music, interviews, uh, our tour schedule, if you want to see where we're traveling around uh, and um, articles we've written and all kinds of stuff. So if you, those are the, that's probably the best way. Wonderful. Paintings of her, yeah, paintings and CDs of art, I mean, CDs of music and Madeline's paintings and art cards and all that stuff. Books. Well, a, lot, know, yeah. a lot more to talk about for part two, I'm sure. Great. All Thank right. Thank you <laughs> so much and I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you, Giles. Thank, Thank you. you.